Hi, I'm Bob Stern, and I'm very pleased to contribute to the GeoPRISM's Synthesis Workshop, Extensional Processes Across Tectonic Settings and Timescales. I've been invited to talk about ancient rifts, which is a very big topic. The topic of ancient systems is often overlooked, partly because geoprisms and its predecessor margins emphasized active systems. But ancient rifts and rifts on other planets provide important insights into the rifting process and to the body's tectonic history and should be kept in mind. There are a number of ways to broach this topic, but the perspective I'd like to offer is this one. My talk is entitled, Folks are arguing about when plate tectonics began. Should rifts care? The answer to this question is yes, because rifts behave differently depending on the planet's thermal structure and tectonic regime. Most importantly, rifts can evolve into seafloor spreading if and only if there are associated subduction zones, and this requires plate tectonics. Rifts on silicate planets without plate tectonics are fundamentally different from rifts on planets with plate tectonics. This begs the question, what other tectonic regime besides plate tectonics is there? To answer that question, we need to consider the three other large, active, rocky planets and moons of our solar system. All three have some kind of single-lid tectonics. Only Earth has plate tectonics. Jupiter's innermost moon, Io, is very active because of strong tidal forces and experiences heat pipe tectonics, where lavas erupt from scattered volcanoes. Young lava flows bury older lava flows, which are eventually depressed, ultimately reaching the molten zone where they are remelted and re-erupted. Tectonics on the Hadean Earth may have been like this. Another single-lid tectonic style is that of Venus, which is characterized by many lithospheric drips and mantle plumes. This is a vigorous style of single-lid tectonics. Something like this might have been Earth's tectonic style after it cooled enough to begin growing mantle lithosphere. Mars is the third example of active single-lid tectonics in our solar system. It seems to be characterized by a few long-lived mantle plumes and is an example of sluggish single-lid tectonics. Perhaps something like that of Mesoproterozoic Earth before plate tectonics started. We'll discuss this possibility further. One insight we can take away from this planetary perspective is that there are other tectonic styles than plate tectonics that Earth likely experienced at different times over its 4.56 billion year history. How would rifts behave during those times? Again, it is useful to examine the evidence from Venus and Mars. The vigorously active single-lid planet Venus has many rifts, 59 in all. These are associated with volcanoes and plume-related upwellings called coronas. The sluggishly active single-lid planet Mars has fewer rifts, most of which radiate away from the most volcanically active region, the Tharsis Rise. The biggest Martian rift by far is Valles Marineris, which is more than 4,000 kilometers long, 200 kilometers wide, and up to 7 kilometers deep. But it doesn't seem to be associated with any volcanoes. There are some interesting differences between modern Earth rifts and those of Mars. For example, Martian rifts tend to be narrower than those of the same length on Earth. A takeaway lesson from comparing rifts on active rocky planets is that hotter bodies have more and wider rifts because the lithosphere is thinner and weaker, and these rifts have more igneous activity than rifts on cooler active bodies. This insight is useful in thinking about rifts through Earth history. It seems that rifts are associated with all tectonically active rocky planets, whether these have single lid or plate tectonic styles, and that these rifts differ in ways that we are just beginning to understand. Given that Earth must have evolved from heat pipe to vigorous single lid to plate tectonics as its mantle cooled, Earth rifts must have evolved as well. The next questions are when did plate tectonics begin on Earth and what was Earth's tectonic style before that? These are big questions and what do we do when we have a big unanswered question? We ask Google. Google 
says that plate tectonics began 800 million years ago. But in fact, this is a much more controversial topic than Google appreciates. Most geoscientists think plate tectonics began much earlier, in Archean times. I, along with increasing numbers of geoscientists, think they are wrong. This controversy is great fun and can't be examined properly here. We do need to briefly consider the evidence that Mesoproterozoic Earth was characterized by a sluggish single-lit episode that transformed in Neoproterozoic time into the modern plate tectonic regime, and then using this to explore how Mesoproterozoic rifts differed from modern ones. The Mesoproterozoic is the most underappreciated era in Earth history, encompassing 600 million years, and is part of what some geoscientists call the Boring Billion, a time when little of interest happened. I think the Mesoproterozoic was not boring, just different and I'll explain why. Before we give some love to the Mesoproterozoic, let's look at the evidence for plate tectonics that is preserved in the rock record and how these vary through time. There are three groups of plate tectonic indicators. Those for seafloor spreading and subduction initiation, those for subduction, and those for continental collision. Seafloor spreading, subduction initiation, subduction, and continental collision are all hallmarks of plate tectonics and do not happen during single lid tectonic regimes. Let's look at these three groups separately. Ophiolites are slices of oceanic lithosphere preserved on land, and these are excellent proxies for seafloor spreading and subduction initiation. These are abundant in Neoproterozoic and younger times and are missing from older times, except for a few at 1.9 to 2.1 billion years ago. There are three metamorphic rocks and minerals that only form in the unique subduction zone environment, and thus are subduction proxies. Blue schists, lawsonite bearing eclogites, and the pyroxene variety of jade called jadeite. These show a similar distribution in time to ophiolites. Finally, there are two indicators of continental collision, ultra-high pressure metamorphic rocks, or UHP metamorphic rocks, and the gemstone ruby. UHP metamorphic rocks contain minerals, diamond or stichovite, that can only form at depths of 100 kilometers or more in the Earth, demonstrating deep subduction of continental crust and return of this material to the surface. Rubies form in silica-poor environments where there is a lot of chromium, an environment only found in continental collision zones. These continental collision proxies are limited to late Neoproterozoic and younger times, although isolated ruby deposits are found earlier in Earth history. The six plate tectonic indicators, with the exception of one ruby deposit, are missing from the 600 million years of Mesoproterozoic time. The 600 million year gap in plate tectonic proxies during Mesoproterozoic time is powerful evidence that plate tectonics did not happen. In a paper published in the December 2020 issue of GSA Today, I argued that the Mesoproterozoic was a protracted episode of single lid tectonics. Half of the argument comes from the absence of plate tectonic proxies, as just discussed. The other half of the argument comes from unusual igneous rocks, thermal gradients inferred from metamorphic terrains, and the lack of evidence for formation of passive continental margins. Unusual igneous rocks include abundant A-type granites and massif-type anorthosites. Both of these rock types reflect unusually dry magmas, as expected for a tectonic regime that lacks subduction zones. Another expectation for single-lid tectonic regimes is that the mantle will be more insulated and cool less efficiently than for plate tectonic regimes. In fact, the mantle might heat up, and this is reflected in calculated thermobarometric ratios determined for metamorphic rocks. Finally, there are almost no confidently identified passive margins for this time, as expected for a single lid tectonic regime. Continental rifts can widen into new oceans only if there is plate tectonics. Formation of passive continental margins is impossible on a planet with single lid tectonics. The implications for our understanding of rifts, if the Mesoproterozoic single lid hypothesis is correct, are profound. First of all, the mantle beneath these rifts should be hotter than beneath modern rifts. 
and therefore should be associated with more igneous rocks. Secondly, mesoproterozoic single lid rifts should evolve differently than modern plate tectonic rifts, never opening into a true ocean with subsiding passive margins. Is there any evidence for these predictions? Let's look at the best example we have of a mesoproterozoic rift, the mid-continent rift, which stretches at least 3,000 kilometers from exposures around Lake Superior south along two buried arms, the eastern arm heading towards Tennessee and Alabama, and the western arm heading towards Oklahoma and Texas. The mid-continent rift was actively extending 1,100 million years ago, about the same time as strong compression affected the Grenville origin to the east and south. The mid-continent rift contains an unusually large amount of igneous rocks in a very focused region compared to Phanerozoic large igneous provinces, as expected for a rift on a single-lid planet. On a planet with plate tectonics, such an energetic system with long lithospheric weaknesses would be expected to continue in opening into an ocean, but that was not possible on single-lid mesoproterozoic Earth. The unusual nature of the mid-continent rift is apparent when comparing gravity profiles over this and two younger rifts, the southern Oklahoma Alakachan of southwest Oklahoma and the real foot rift of northwestern Mississippi, eastern Arkansas, and western Tennessee. The strong gravity high over the western arm of the mid-continent rift reflects the large volume of mafic igneous rocks it contains, which is similar to the situation for the southern Oklahoma Lockagen. It would be interesting to compare gravity profiles for modern rifts as well and begin exploring what these similarities and differences are telling us about Earth's tectonic evolution and cooling history. In conclusion, there's a lot of useful work that could be done with thoughtful study of ancient continental rifts and comparing these to modern rifts. Let's get started. Oh, by the way, if you're looking for a simple video explaining how continental rifts sometimes evolve into new oceans and passive continental margins, check out our seven minute video, Continental Rifting, New Oceans and Passive Continental Margins for Beginners. You can find this easily on our YouTube channel, UTD Geoscience Studios. Please subscribe to our channels while you are there.